soft theism. I'm what I call a soft theist. I believe in the probability of a general God. A God not tied to any particular religion. A God who does not intervene in any tangible way. He doesn't answer prayers or do miracles. He just lets the natural world run. That's the kind of God I believe in. I don't believe in breach of nature miracles. But I think nature itself is a miracle. Life itself, intelligence itself, consciousness itself are miracles that point to some ultimate intelligence as their source. If a human being popped out of a rock, that would be a supernatural event. But isn't that exactly what has happened over billions of years? We're here and we emerged out of rock. I think intelligence coming from intelligence makes more sense than intelligence emerging on its own from molecules. Given that we have the problem of evil, I find God does not make good sense, but makes more sense than no God. A universe coming from an infinite regress of purely physical causes makes less sense to me than a universe coming from some ultimate intelligence. So I believe in the probability of a general God. Unverifiable, certainly not all loving, but I think ultimately loving. The case against Christianity. I've studied Christianity my whole life. I originally set out to understand it better so I could explain it better to others. But eventually, I had to conclude that Christianity, as a belief system, is simply not true. I have discussed all the issues with top Christian apologists, and they consistently fail to come up with good answers, because there are none. Here, succinctly, are my top ten reasons for rejecting Christianity. The God of the Old Testament is deeply unkind. He drowns millions of animals in the flood story with not one iota of compassion. The Christian God is male chauvinistic. First Corinthians says, The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. The Bible's prophecies are phony. They are not predictions remarkably fulfilled but comparisons deliberately drawn, and dishonestly so. Jesus could not have been the Messiah born in Bethlehem because that Messiah was supposed to be a military leader. The biblical God doesn't even know the nature of his own creation. The earth is not set on pillars. Ostriches are not uncaring parents, they're fierce parents. And a basin of given dimensions cannot hold twice as much water as it can mathematically hold. The biblical God condemns homosexuals. That is sheer human bigotry. Jesus had an unrealistic utopian worldview. God does not take care of the birds of the air as Jesus naively presumed. In most species, the mortality rate in the first year is 50%. Basic Christian theology is immoral at the deepest level. One man cannot take on the sins of other men. We are all responsible for our own behavior. And right belief is not the prime virtue. Right behavior is. A valid holy book would not contradict itself, as the Bible constantly does. David cannot have committed only one sin all his life, yet clearly have committed another sin. Not to mention the moral bankruptcy of regarding David as a hero, a man who murdered somebody to get his wife. A book filled with God-directed immorality cannot be a valid book. The biblical God orders genocides, prohibits handicapped people from approaching the altar, 
sees nothing wrong with being happy to dash the enemy's babies against a rock, commands you to stone to death friends and family who leave the religion, and has no problem with slavery referring to people as property. And lastly, if you think a God who has a hell, never-ending severe torture for conscious beings, never-ending that such a God is a just and loving God, then you are morally and theologically an idiot. You have allowed yourself to be brainwashed. If there is a God, I have no doubt that he is ashamed of you for believing such an idea. Now, the average Christian and the more typical liberal Christian would say to me, Mick, my faith is not in literal interpretations of the Bible, but in Jesus, in his persona, his teachings. Really? I don't think so. The case against liberal Christianity. Here are seven of Jesus' core teachings, core teachings which you liberal Christians simply ignore. He taught that remarriage is adultery. But you don't have a problem with remarriage, do you? He accepted slavery as a normal feature of society and never spoke out against it. He used slavery in his parables with no condemnation. He taught that belief is more important than behavior, allowing thieves into heaven and sending good atheists to hell. He claimed your prayers will be granted and that you can move literal mountains by just faith. Neither of these claims are true. He expected the end of the world and his generation. He was flat wrong. He never repudiated the horrible Old Testament God, as he must if he's to be regarded as the ultimate source of wisdom. He taught the concept of hell, something only a religious extremist would teach, not somebody who actually understands the essence of love and justice. You liberal Christians don't accept any of these core teachings of Jesus. So your faith is not in Jesus, but in a whitewashed version of him. The Jesus actually depicted in the Bible was a religious extremist, not your fond reconstruction of him. You say you don't interpret the Bible literally, despite the fact that most of it is presented as literal, and even if passages are interpreted figuratively, you ignore the pernicious lessons they teach, like the Adam and Eve story, where blind obedience is presented as the prime virtue. You say I have to understand the cultural context of the time, no, I don't. Culture does not excuse immorality. Divine wisdom is supposed to transcend culture, not accommodate itself to it. You say Jesus never said anything about homosexuals. I say yes, he did. By his silence, he accepted the Old Testament God, who clearly did condemn homosexuality. You say you don't take hell literally, it's symbolic. But symbols point to an underlying reality, in this case, severe, never-ending suffering. You're trying to pretend Jesus didn't teach what he did teach. You say we don't know what Jesus actually said. I say you have no good reason to think that so much of what he is reported to have said is actually not what he said. You accept his good teachings, but ignore his bad teachings. Which is fine, but don't call yourself a Christian. You're actually a general theist who likes some of Jesus' teachings. So that's why I reject liberal Christianity as a belief system. It's cafeteria Christianity. It's selective. It is not, as liberal Christians proudly presume, the result of more sophisticated interpretations of the Bible, but rather the result of systematic rationalizing and whitewashing. 
The Case for Soft Theism I have a companion video called Defending Soft Theism where I defend my position in detail against atheists. Here is a 12-minute abbreviated version of that video. Weaker Atheist Arguments I think it's a childish conceit to think we are the center of the universe. We're just a speck of dust in a vast, vast universe. I don't think it's childish. We're the only planet we know of that has intelligence on it. And I think, objectively, that's pretty damn special. All right, but to say that God is the cause of something explains nothing. That's not science. It's lazy. It's God of the gaps thinking. I agree that invoking God for the trillions of things that happen is a lazy, superstitious, valueless way to think. But invoking God for the origin and the sustenance of the whole deal, that makes sense to me. I don't posit God to explain lightning, but I do posit God to explain the universe. But if you posit a God, you immediately have the problem of who made God? Where did God come from? Why not, more simply, grant self-causation to the universe? Because the universe is a physical entity, and physical entities need a cause. Whereas a non-physical entity, like God, admittedly a hypothesis, would not need a cause. The Atheist Mindset I think you only believe in God because you've presupposed God in the first place. No, no, no. After I rejected traditional concepts of God, I asked myself the open-ended question, does a more general God not tied to any particular religion make sense? I didn't presuppose anything. I think you're the one who is presupposing that science is the only measure of reality, period. But a God would violate all the laws of physics. A God who is not beyond the laws of physics is a caricature of the concept of God. If you define God like that as subject to physics, then of course there's no such God. The God question is more a matter of metaphysics, not physics. Philosophy, not science. I think science and evolution are the best explanations for reality. Well, yes, they, they do explain how things work, but not why they should work. That is a subtle but critical difference you atheists never get. Explaining how things work is not explaining why they should work. Science explains the steps but does not explain the overall process of why nature would organize its own self-awareness out of rocks. Christian Viewpoints What do you think of Jesus? I think Jesus was a misguided religious extremist. He constantly overstated things for the sake of impact at the expense of truth. And, and you can't present yourself as the all-compassionate one and at the same time threaten people with hell if they don't accept your theology. So you don't believe in the traditional concept of an intervening God. No, I believe in a God who lets the natural world run. Another label one could use for soft theism might be warm deism. Warm deism, where a deity is involved, does care, but not in any intervening or verifiable way. But if your almost deistic God is so non-intervening, what good is he? I'm left wondering why believe at all. Because, intellectually, I think God is a good theoretical ultimate explanation for the world. And, pragmatically, given that we can neither prove nor disprove God, it's a legitimate, happier mindset to think that there is some good resolution ahead, and not just dust. Do you have any evidence that God cares about us? Yeah, not hard evidence, but soft evidence. Tendencies tendencies that I interpret as his care. For one, our, our species is largely thriving on the planet. Our bodies have the capacity to usually heal. Life is intelligible rather than a total crapshoot. And there exist deeply joyful experiences in life. 
I interpret all these positive aspects of life as some evidence of God's care for us. Do you have faith in this vague God of yours? Yeah, but not in the sense of believing that it's a fact, but of believing that that's what makes the most sense. Doesn't make sense to me. The flawed design of the world does not reflect an intelligent creator. Yeah, right. I think the poor design is an argument against God. But the fact that it works is an argument for God. Another argument Christians make for God is the morality argument. Do you think the existence of morality is evidence for God? On a subjective personal level, I do. I have a deep sense of cosmic morality beyond reciprocal altruism. But on an intellectual level, I find the argument never really gets anywhere. Christians will claim that without God, you get cultural relativism. But I respond, even with a God, you get religious relativism. Because which God is the right God? Different gods have different moralities. Isis thinks that its God is the source of true morality. Theists are not exempt from the problem of subjectivity. You think we atheists are a force for evil? No, 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 not at all. Dawkins, for example, I like Dawkins a lot. I agree with his militant stance against traditional religion. And I think the whole thrust of what Michael Shermer does is a real force for good. <laughs> I'm, I'm on your side on almost everything. The, the harmful nature of traditional religion, the value of science, the separation of church and state. I just disagree with you on the broad philosophical question of God. The first cause argument. What's your strongest argument for God? The first cause argument. A universe popping into existence without a cause, or coming from an infinite, never-ending regress of purely physical causes, seems less plausible to me than a universe coming from some ultimate immaterial power. I am postulating an immaterial cause, whereas you are postulating no cause at all or you're postulating an endless regress of physical causes. I can't conceive of an immaterial non-physical cause. I don't see any magical non-physical causes working in the world. I do. If I raise my arm, that's due to a non-physical cause, my will. You could say it was the contraction of certain muscles, but what caused those muscles to contract? And what caused that cause? At some point, you run out of physical causes. I say the real cause of my raising my arm is my non-physical, free will decision to do so. I think it's absurd to say something physical is the root cause of my raising my arm. Similarly, for the universe, at some point, you run out of purely physical causes. And to me, it makes sense to posit an ultimate immaterial cause. I think there is an immaterial world of intentionality. If I asked you why this kettle of water is boiling, you'd probably say because the water molecules have reached a certain temperature. I would say, well, yeah, but the real reason is that I wanted to make a pot of tea. You have a scientific mindset. I have a more spiritual mindset. Immaterial realities. I think the mistake you're making is reification. You're treating ideas as though they are something real. I think ideas are real. It's just that they're not physical. There are immaterial realities. I don't see this immaterial world of yours. As Carl Sagan explained, there's no difference between an invisible, undetectable in any way dragon and a non-existent dragon. Would you say a mother's love for her children, because it is invisible, does not exist? Doesn't exist because science can't prove it? I say there are immaterial realities, which are detectable, but in non-scientific ways. I can think of other things that are invisible, but real. Mathematics. Time. Reason. These things are ideas, yet they are real. But there's no such thing as a soul. We are 
simply a collection of functioning molecules. I object to the word simply. I think we're more than simply functioning molecules. We have life, intelligence, consciousness, emotions. There will always be a difference between a human being and a robot. A robot does not have real emotions. And I think we're chemicals and electricity and everything is reducible to that. Consciousness is an emergent phenomenon. Well, yeah, but I notice you just acknowledged that consciousness is a, quote, phenomenon. I go one step further and regard it as miraculous. Why would some intelligence be required for chemistry to progress to the point of what we call life? All I can say is, how could it not require it? <laughs> to me, it's axiomatic. It's obvious. No matter how long it took, consciousness emerging from rocks does not make sense to me unless there is some conscious intelligence behind the whole process. The problem of evil. If God exists, why the excess of evil beyond what's necessary for developing character? Yeah, it's not the way we would have made the world. A possible answer is that maybe God intended an imperfect, seriously challenging world as the best way for us to develop character. But you're right, the excess doesn't make sense. I think the problem of evil is the strongest argument against theism. Seems to me this God does not merit worship. Good point. But I don't worship like Christians do, praising and groveling. I can't unreservedly love such a mixed entity. He gives us beautiful sunsets, but he also gives our children fatal diseases. God's sins against us are greater than our sins against him. No, I worship God not by liking or praising Him, but by doing the one thing He wants of us, behaving well. In my mind, that's how to properly love God. But isn't the problem of evil a knockdown argument against God? Yes, I think it is. But, 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 <laughs> I think the infinite regress argument is a knockdown argument for God. And I find that argument a stronger one because I see no possible rebuttal to it. Whereas for the problem of evil argument, there is a possible answer. Not a good answer, but a possible answer. Which is? That if there is an afterlife of ultimate justice and happiness, then that outweighs the evil we experience in this life. Mathematically, any number over infinity, no matter how large the number, approaches zero. Likewise, any suffering, no matter how great, compared to an infinity of happiness in an afterlife, amounts to nothing. Well, that's just speculation. Yeah, it's speculation, but it is a logical, theoretical answer to the problem of evil. So, that's the bottom line for me. The knockdown argument for God outweighs the knockdown argument against God. The impossibility of infinite regress beats the problem of evil. Well, I've enjoyed this discussion. I don't agree with you, but it was not the usual nonsense I hear from Christians and other theists. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you for your thoughts. Beyond intellectual discussion about God, personally, my belief in a probable God comes from my deepest natural intuition, that there must be some ultimate resolution to life. The questions, why is there life? Why is there love, beauty, meaning? These questions point to a God, to a source for these transcendent experiences. I do not discount the powerful experiences religious people have had within their religions, but I do claim they are attributing them to the wrong God, the wrong theology. And lastly, I think a lot of religious people subconsciously actually agree with me that soft theism, a position between traditional religion on the one side and atheism on the other, is the most reasonable position. 
Thanks for watching, and don't forget the longer version for a more detailed discussion of soft theism.